Matthew is also from Adobe, as you already have realized. Um, one of his specialties is structured documents. And he will say a few things about that tomorrow in, in a special session. And now he's going to give us a quick overview of what PDF is and why it's yes. something we <clears throat> So I'm going to attempt in the next seven minutes to give you a look at sort of what's going on in the PDF standards committee now that we're, we're past the original version. So. Um, moving on to the first page. So, the first version of PDF ratified by ISO was basically the, uh, was, was, was released by Adobe in 2008 to, to ISO. And the intent of that standard was to capture the live document format that existed in the world. Adobe had published that as a, as a de facto standard for many years, and the intent was to capture exactly the nuance and what people were implementing uh, and, and to keep it at that. We weren't allowed to make changes other than editorial changes to the specification and to convert it from the Adobe format to ISOEs, as we like to call it. Um, and we succeeded. We did it, and I say this as we, the committee, succeeded. Um, PDF 1.7 was released and the job was complete for the first version of uh, ISO PDF. So what has the committee been doing since then? We started working on PDF 2.0, ISO 32000 Part 2. And we had four primary goals for that. The first was to enhance the language where appropriate without making major changes. We wanted to refine it so where there was any lack of clarification or understanding in the standard, we wanted to ensure that that was cleared up, that we made uh, normative changes. Um, we wanted to deprecate all functionality. And we wanted to continue the process of standardizing it to bring more and more of the, the, the references into the ISO family. And the intent was to democratize PDF. The intent was to get industry experts involved in continuing the growth of PDF and releasing it from Adobe Control. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the enhancements and the refinements we've been making over the past four years. So basically, we put a few new features in there. PDF is not going to change significantly between PDF 1.7 and 2.0. It's not going to change from being a, 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 a paginated format. It's, it's fundamentally the PDF you know and hopefully love. Um, but we have added some new capabilities. We've enhanced some of the media features. We've, um, we, we've added new 3D support, which is uh, one of the topics that will be talked about uh, tomorrow, I believe, PRC. Um, we've continued the expansion of digital signatures, including long-term validation and, and other enhancements. And we've just basically kept growing it. My own personal uh, sort of interests are in uh, accessibility and type PDF. And so I did put a mention of the enhancements for support for MathML 3.0 and, and other sort of accessibility components. But it's small incremental changes, keeping the language stable, but allowing it to grow to meet the needs of the industry as it changes. We've also been refining it. Um, you know, the, although the committee did an incredibly good job of taking an a large standard and moving it from, from a, a, a de facto standard to a de jure standard, um, there, are, there are areas where there is a lack of clarification, um, where things are misunderstood or there's confusion or ambiguity in how to implement them. One of the major goals of PDF 2.0 has, has been to resolve this lack of clarity and to add normative language where possible to clarify. For example, what happens when, uh, you know, when you're dashing a path and you get to some sort of degenerate condition? Um, we've tried to make it very clear so that everyone can implement PDF the same way. We've also been making small corrections. It's no surprise to anyone that when you have a standard as large as PDF, there are mistakes, usually small typos and, 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 and grammatical errors. And so we've been trying to go over PDF 2.0 with a fine tooth comb, making sure that we're basically bringing it up to a 2.0 standard. We've also been looking at deprecation for PDF. PDF was an additive language. So from PDF 1.0 to 1.7, each, um, each version built upon the previous version. We, we never took stuff out of it. <laughs> and that means that over time, things have replaced other things and, and, and new mechanisms have been put in place that, that, that overrode the old ones. But you could still use both. And as I said, PDF 1.7 had to be the exact standard that was already out and that the world was using. In PDF 2.0, we've taken the opportunity to remove a few fully deprecated components. And things like um, the info dictionary, which has been replaced by XMP metadata. Um, some of the old um, sort of sound and movie annotations, which have been replaced by much more capable multimedia and rich media capabilities. Um, and obviously, as cryptography has moved along, 
you know, some of the older forms of cryptography have become insecure or broken, and we've, we've done our best to kind of move those along. And so uh, in those places, and we want to make it clear that you know, from, a, from a consumption standpoint, most consumers are expected to process PDF 1.7 and 2.0. So from an, from an implementation standpoint, you, st you, you still need to implement the 1.7 features for, for many readers. But when you're writing new PDF 2.0 documents, these, these shall not be in the language. And it's, it's to try to slowly phase them out so that they are not part of the language. Um, and I mentioned that we would be trying to standardize PDF. And, and PDF is a standard. It's an ISO standard. No more work needs to be done there. But PDF refers in its, in its references to other de facto standards. And so the committee has been making an attempt in recent years to, to slowly move others of those de facto standards to de jure standards. Things like the JavaScript reference are now going to actually be part of the PDF standard rather than having to look at an Adobe-specific document. And things like our rich text processing algorithms for, for form fields, again, will be part of the standard. So we're trying to move more and more away from the idea of all these third-party references to a more consistent, coherent single standard. Um, and we've also been updating standards where appropriate. Um, PDF is very clear about, it names a specific revision of a standard so that PDF is not a moving target. When you implement PDF 2.0, you implement only the, 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 the specification of it. And so if someone puts out a new open type font format or some new cryptography standard, unless we update PDF 2.0 or a future version, you use the current versions. And so we've taken the opportunity in PDF 2.0 to move some of those standards along to newer versions. It's also important to remember that PDF 2.0 is not finished. The, committee, the ISO committee is still working very hard on getting this done. We've just put out our first draft international standard, the DIS. Before that, we had four committee drafts. So there's still a lot of opportunity for fixes and changes to go in. Uh, that said, a, a draft international standard means that most of the coherent work is part of the standard, but we certainly, there's certainly opportunity for involvement. So one of the things we want to do as a committee is to, to reach out to all industry experts and say, get involved. If you're interested in sort of defining PDF, there's still plenty of opportunity to do so. Um, and so, you know, think about that, uh, working with your member countries, um, sort of standards body to get involved. Anyway, that's the end of my presentation. So... Thank you. I hope that was a, a, a rather quick <laughs> coverage of, of the PDF standard. And Lennon is going to speak about PDFA, and we will try to find your presentation. And that one. That one. That one. Great. Thanks so often. All right, so um, taking you back a little further than Matthew did, uh, back to 2005, we released, and, and we in this case, as Matthew said, is the ISO committees, the first version of PDFA, uh, PDFA 1. And as many of you know or, or remember, we're talking about a standard focused on the needs of long-term archiving for PDF content. And for that, we really took out a whole lot of things, a lot of the features of PDF that were ambiguous, that were confusing, um, that weren't well understood at the time. We removed from the language things that don't fit into the archival world, for example, encryption and digital rights that were inappropriate, and we tightened up the language. Um, things, for example, white space. The white space rules in PDF, as you know, are very flexible. We didn't want that in a long-term standard, so we tightened up those sorts of rules and other file format rules. And that got us PDF A1. And it, it's worked very well. Uh, it is actually, an inter for those of you who don't know, PDF A is actually adopted as a national standard in over 50 countries uh, around the world, uh, including ju just last week, India adopted both PDF and PDFA as national standards. So this is still an ongoing process. It's not even something that's stopped. Uh, and so clearly uh, the work is good. And in fact, uh, all of you in adopting it in your products have made that happen. So you know, as, as the project leader for PDFA, I say thank you for making all of our hard work a reality. But the committee didn't stop. Uh, just this year in June, PDFA2 became Oh, sorry, last year. Yeah, it is 2012 already, isn't it? <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Stefan. 
All right, just last year, it feels like this year, anyway, not that long ago. <laughs> uh, uh, PDF 82 was ratified and published, so you can all go get a copy if you don't already have it. And again, we've evolved it. So the main, the main difference here was to move from the Adobe standard, PDF 81 was focused around Adobe PDF 1.4. We now are built around ISO 32000, so we like to say that this is a pure ISO standard, and that it's referring entirely to ISO bits, at least where it can. Um, and as Matthew said, we'll continue to move that forward. And then to adopt newer functionality. And so as you can see from the green bits here, we also incorporated some of the new functionality present in newer versions of PDF. And I'll talk about some of those um, in an upcoming slide. But the majority is unchanged. The core remains the same. Tight, rigid PDF file structure, no security, no DRM, no interactivity. All of the philosophy that we've had throughout time remains the same but we, move, we evolve that, if you will, to new PDF functionality. And not to be undone, we have one more version currently in the pipe, which is PDF A3, which, fingers crossed, will be ratified, let me get, see if I get this right, next, no, still March, so two months mm -hmm. from now, uh, in May will be the next meeting of the ISO committee, and we should ratify it. It's currently out for vote right now in a second DIS. And it has one and only one change from part two. And that is a change in how attachments are done. Um, and I'll talk about that very briefly shortly. So we're talking about a very simple evolution. And the reasoning between the three versions is they don't replace each other. Unlike other standards, this is not a replacement standard. All three will remain present. All three are valid. And we expect that all three will be used by different groups at different times because they serve different purposes. The way we like to think of it is, if you don't need anything more than PDF A1, stick with it. It works, it's great, and there's no reason to move forward. But if your documents, your content, need the extra features of part two, then utilize it, move up to part two. And if you're looking at a model where attachments of related content is important, then you adopt part three, okay? So you can pick and you being developers, you being users, pick the parts that make the most sense. So just to, to hit on a few things, and again, as you've worked, I'm sure most of you know these features, you've seen them in PDF proper, but things that we specifically called out as important as we moved from PDF A1 to A2 and A3. Um, transparency, of course, we support the full PDF transparency model. Improved compression, this was a big uh, request from the industry, especially for JPEG 2000 and people doing scans. I know we're gonna hear a lot about that this week. Support for layers and optional content. Packages and collections, and as we said, we, we moved PDFA, that's been a big part, has been the idea of incorporating not just the PDF, but other types of content into that document, to having a single container with all of your relevant pieces brought together. Um, to make Matthew happy, we of course improved tagging and accessibility. Um, Duff, I understand, was happy with that as well. So yeah, good, get a thumbs up. Uh, so that's a big deal, of course, for the, uh, the A version. As you know, there's, a, there's two levels in PDF A1. Level B is the basic, and level A being the accessible or the all version. And I'll talk momentarily about a new level that was introduced, which is the U level. Um, I'm also going to speak about, in fact, actually, let me take to the next slide. So the other big thing, at least from my perspective, that took place as we moved to PDF A2 and A3 was an alignment with European standards. Um, and Berndt is going to talk next um, about PADES, so I won't spend too much time. But PADES is the advanced signature standard here in the European Union for PDF signatures. If you digitally sign a PDF A2 document, the way it is required makes you compliant with PADES. So every single PDF A2 and A3 digitally signed document complies with EU legislation. That's huge, okay? And as I said, Barrett will talk more about it. But that was a really big deal for the committee to get that alignment with European legislation. And of course, we see that same legislation being adopted elsewhere. I mentioned briefly level U. This is an intermediate level between A and B. Don't ask me how the U comes between those two letters, but that's how it actually works. Um, 
the idea being that you can't go all the way to full accessible and full tagging. You don't have that much information, but you do have all of the Unicode data. And so you at least want to make all of the text extractable. And that's where level U comes in. That's okay. That was perfect. I got enough. So it was <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Closing no. sentence? Closing sentence. Thank you. <laughs> So there's, there's a letter E in the PDF slash E and what this is this E about. Um, it's about um, it's about engineering. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the interesting thing is engineering is not just one thing that's, that's kind of, you, you get it in, 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 in one look and you know what it is. It's, it's pretty widespread. It really ranges from constructing microchips to refrigerators or houses to bridges, airplanes and power plants and many other things. Um, and it's obvious that uh, doing a microchip is slightly different than constructing a bridge. Um, it's pretty information heavy on, on, on several levels, um, and documentation is something that's documentation is something that's very important for um, for engineering. Maybe it's the most the, the industry with the with the highest documentation needs. Um, and not only that, in this industry or in this kind of uh, family of industries. Um, you need document, different document types for different types of documents. Uh, and there could be specifications or manuals, which is still kind of text heavy, like a normal book or, or a, a similar document. But you have drawings, and not just some trivial drawings uh, illustrating a, a few things. It's like really complex drawings uh, on, on two dimensions. And then it also goes into the uh, third dimension. And it's become commonplace to work heavily with 3D models of whatever you're constructing. Um, and then it doesn't stop there and they even move into animations, uh, animated sequences of 3D models, even interaction with those movies and so forth. So it's really uh, kind of the, the most demanding requirements in each of these dire directions. Um, and PDF has turned out to be quite a decent technology to take care of these needs in a number of ways. Uh, and again, it's, it's very widespread. It's not just that you create a piece of documentation like a, a manual and then you read it and that's it. Uh, PDF is, is used very widely in engineering for reading documents, for sharing documents, which is um, a much more complicated need than in other industries, if I may say so. Um, because if you're using AutoCAD or Cartier or some of these tools and you want to show your thing to somebody else who didn't pay for the license for, for one of these tools, um, or just didn't install it, it's very difficult to look at that. And so PDF turned out to be a very, uh, very nice tool to, to just uh, move stuff around and share it with other people. It has to be protected. Sometimes it's very uh, confidential information that's being ex exchanged. It has to be reviewed. We want to interact. Um, they want to annotate, mm -hmm. uh, comment on, on the content. There's approval uh, workflows. Uh, digital signatures uh, do play a role in some cases. Uh, you want to still print stuff. Um, you need to archive it. There's very, uh, sometimes very strict uh, archiving requirements in these industries. Uh, so con construction information for bridges has to be kept for 100 years and stuff like that. Um, sometimes you have to be able to prove something was uh, like you pretend it was 5, 10, 20 years ago. So it's, it's very demanding needs around that. Um, and in order to address this uh, and kind of to make stuff um, fit better for the needs of the engineering industry, uh, a standard was developed based on, on PDF. Um, and that's kind of the title page of this standard. It came out in early 2008 after a few years of work on the standard. Uh, some people from some large players in the industry had been involved. Um, and just to make very clear what, what uh, PDF did, tries to achieve, uh, this is the, the first sentence of the scope statement of the standard. Uh, so this part of ISO 24517 specifies the use of the of PDF uh, for the creation of documents used in engineering workflows. So it's, it's mostly focused on creating those documents. It's not saying much about uh, what you actually do with them in, in the end. Um, what has been done, so what, what is different between PDF V and, and just normal uh, PDF? Uh, so the degrees of freedom have been reduced in some ways. Uh, and the goal was to uh, re increase reliability. The problem was sometimes PDF works, or at least actually uh, most of the time it works, but sometimes it doesn't. The printout doesn't look right, display on the screen doesn't look right, something's missing, something's not working. It doesn't happen very often, but in this industry it's a no-no to even have it happen once. 
Um, so the rules had been kind of based on some of the uh, rules in PDFX and PDFA, the standards that had been developed before. Uh, so the best stuff from these standards uh, was, was kept. But uh, certain things need to be, had to be allowed that were forbidden in the other standards. And that is, for example, interactivity or 3D models. So kind of the interesting stuff to this industry, of course, had to be possible to, uh, still. Um, they even allowed encryption. That was a no-no for PDFX, for, for print file exchange, and for PDFA, for general purpose archiving. Um, and uh, it looked like a, a very decent standard, uh, but the effect that uh, we had to, to see over the years, uh, starting in 2008, was it seems that the difference between a regular OK PDF and the PDF E1 was difficult to explain. So the, the audience that would be using it kind of had difficulty seeing the difference. Developers didn't find it easy to develop something that kind of uh, exercises this difference and makes the format useful to, to, to users. Um, and we had to, to realize that relatively few tools actually support PDF E1 specifically. So of course Adobe does an Acrobat and some other developers do it in, in their offerings. But it's, it's really the least successful standard so far, I, I, I dare say. And, and to, the, to, be, to the best of my knowledge, it's hardly adopted um, in, in engineering anywhere. Some companies, I think, are using it, but it's, you don't hear from them. So we hear from all the other uh, standards. We don't hear much from users uh, doing something with PDF-E. So to be honest, PDF-E1 was not extremely successful. When there's a one, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a one, there's a two, and in two, we, you will have to read the slides. We will, <laughs> we will try to get the stuff right. Um, and just, uh, I should stop this. Just one more sentence and I'll give up. Um, there's, um, there's one thing that, that could make the difference, and that's why you should maybe follow the, uh, what's going on here. Uh, archiving will be served much better. This is really a very serious need in the industry, and we expect to come up with something that addresses archiving well in the engineering field and gets some of the other things right and, and does a kind of technological update to accommodate more recent developments. But that's kind of going to be the focus. Um, and it's going pro probably going to be published around the time when PDF 2.0 gets published for a number of reasons. Thank you. Okay, well, I've started my presentation. That's okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Duff Johnson here. I'm the uh, uh, chair of the U.S. Committee for PDF UA, um, starting in 2005, a long time ago, many meetings. And I'm also the project co-project leader or project co-leader for ISO 32000 with a colleague of mine from Microsoft. I'm going to introduce ISO 14289 to you in seven minutes. This is a... Um, this is uh, very fun for me, and it's, I think you, you will find it interesting. This is a brand new standard uh, to be ratified today, or to be ratified this year. <laughs> you can ratify it right now. I'm going to tell you a little bit about accessibility and why we need PDFUA, maybe a little bit about what it is, some key terms, uh, some benefits, and of course, uh, why we need PDF. Can I upload the updated one of these. <laughs> anyway, so we're moving on past that slide. What is accessibility? It's not obvious to everybody what accessibility is. Um, in fact, there's a lot of, uh, there, there's quite a bit of debate in, even in the community of, of developers for accessibility, what accessibility might be. The classical definition of accessibility would be to describe the degree to which a product or device or service environment is available to as many people as possible. And this is actually, and the scope is uh, a little larger when it comes to PDF. Is it because we're not just talking about people in terms of consuming PDF files. For accessible PDF files and software, we can understand accessibility as uh, the ability to, as, as something that enables uh, users who require assistive technology, gives them the ability to read electronic documents and to interact with PDF, uh, to use interactive forms. Accessible PDF delivers or can deliver high quality results uh, viewed on mobile devices and on other platforms, reflowed onto web pages and so forth uh, when extracted as HTML, assuming, of course, that that consuming device uh, can consume PDF tags. And that's a big hint to uh, everybody in here who writes software. <laughs> uh, it's important, uh, uh, accessible PDF, uh, can, and, and it's very related, of course, to its, uh, to its utility in terms of mobile devices. A PDF, uh, an accessible PDF file delivers good results 
and copying, pasting, or extracting content to HTML because, of the, because the, uh, somebody has done the work of managing the process in which all this content fits together in a logical, in a logical order. Uh, and, and something that's also relatively underappreciated, if a PDF file is properly structured, <coughs> properly tagged, it enables high quality indexing of that content by search engines. Uh, absent that kind of structuring, um, search engines have a little bit of a hit or miss problem when it comes to getting, doing anything useful in PDF. So I'll just give you a very, very basic uh, um, uh, uh, introduction to the kind of problem the PDF UA is attempting to solve, and we're going to get into this more in the PDF UA track. Imagine that this is a page. Okay, it's a relatively simple page. In fact, it's so simple that even I could write the code to describe it. And, this is, and I'll admit to you up front, and you're going to hear more about this in my own session, I'm not a developer. I'm going to have to admit to you, this to you up front. And this is, in fact, the only PDF code that I've ever written. Um, <laughs> hopefully, you can't find a problem with it, and I don't want to hear about it even if you can. <laughs> so the interesting thing about PDF UA is quite simply that this is valid ISO 32000 code. The interesting thing about it, of course, is that when read in, in literal content order, it doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't follow what your mind, uh, your mind understands that this is a two columns here, uh, the, the sentence has been broken up into two columns, and you read down here, and then you read the next one. The PDF has no kind of sense of that. Instead, it would, if you only read the content order in this PDF, it wouldn't make any sense. And this is the precise problem that PDF UA is attempting to solve. So accessible PDF has been possible since Adobe released Acrobat 5.0 in, in 2000. But accessibility, first and foremost, is optional in ISO 32000, as it was optional in all versions of the PDF reference up until 32000. ISO 32000 and the, and the versions of the PDF reference that came before that, I would suggest to you, do not describe accessibility features in PDF. They, they are there. They're present. They have been present since 1.4 but it doesn't describe them clearly enough so that all implementers might agree on precisely what it is that they're trying to do. And there's an enormous amount of confusion in the industry, particularly for the non-PDF developers, but also, quite frankly, in the PDF space. There's confusion over what it is precisely that you're attempting to implement and where you're attempting to get that information from in the PDF file. Consequently, the lack of a common understanding has, ex has impaired software development and has created out there in the world the perception, or has uh, allowed the perception to continue that PDF is fundamentally inaccessible. And that is, in fact, in the world of, for the world of developers, for the world of consumers who rely upon assistive technology to read, that is their perception of PDF at this time. And PDF UA was created to make sure that, number one, that it was understood that that wasn't true, and number two, to do something about uh, creating, uh, creating a baseline set of circumstances that would allow that not to, be, not to continue. So PDF UA, first of all, provides a single normative understanding of what constitutes accessibility in PDF. It removes uh, much of the confusion surrounding the question of whether or not you read the content order or whether or not you go look at the tags instead, something that's relatively ambiguous in, in ISO 32000 Part 1. PDF UA also, of course, provides implementers with a clear means, not of course, and there's some controversy about this effect, but in fact it does, and I, I would suggest to you, there's a clear means of achieving WCAG 2.0 conformance in PDF context when you're using PDF UA. Uh, for those of you who have encountered uh, this requirement before, characteristically, it was a, a WCAG 2.0 uh, web content accessibility guidelines it's developed oriented towards web content. Well, PDF can often be web content, and so many organizations adopting WCAG are also asking uh, their people who produce PDF files to make PDF be WCAG compliant as well. PDF UA is the way to achieve that. So UA, what does it stand for? Universal accessibility. Uh, we, as I've already said, it provides norms for the technical means of accessibility in PDF files. It, it does, covers three large areas. PDF files, the conformance standards for a writer that would, produce, uh, that would produce a PDF document. The PDF processor that consumes a PDF document for the purposes of, of, uh, of, uh, of reuse or uh, placing it in an accessibility uh, assistive technology context. We also have requirements in the standard for assistive technology specifically. They're not very detailed. They basically say, yeah, you have to consume everything that we specify in the standard. <laughs> based on an uh, important characteristic of PDF UA is it's based on 32,000 part one. Uh, there are no additions to the PDF language. So that, what does it do? It's, it's a short document, 23 pages or so. Much of that is taken up by the stuff that, the, by, the, uh, by the front matter. Very simply, PDF UA, I'm almost done. 
It requires elements that are optional in 32,000. It restricts or prohibits certain features that are available in 32,000. Some additional specifications that are lacking in 32,000. And I think that was in the previous slide. Oh, I can't tell you about. Oh, there, so there are some key terms here that I'm going, you're going to learn a lot more about. And what I'm doing right now is advertising the PDF UA track. Come learn about real content. I bet you never thought you had to worry about that. Uh, so here are some of the key terms that are going to be very important to you. I really should have talked about the benefits of PDF UA. <laughs> <laughs> you were wondering when I was going to get to this, I know. But now you should, but, so that's why you have to come to my track. Oh boy, I wrote way too many slides. <laughs> so, I think. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Good Good morning. Morning. Adobe, long. You've yeah. Been 22 years. Yeah. Um, started with PostScript level two. Can you set my timer? Okay. We're going to make this as quick as possible. I was born in New York. I know how to talk very quickly. Okay. Um, and the, if you really want the details, you're going to come this afternoon to our track where we have three very good speakers. Why should the industry be interested in this? Is because this is the only damn growth area of the print industry. Personalization. One of the few, I should say. Okay. And that. One of the important things if you can make money in that business is to have a unified workflow. And the idea that PDF VT can actually do personalization as opposed to other types of methods of printing is rather important. We'll talk about that later this afternoon. What is it? It's an ISO standard based upon uh, PDFX. It was published in August 2010. It was one of the longest in-process uh, PDF substandards that were there, primarily because it wasn't just a matter of technical issues related to the PDF, but it was really a business that we were putting together. How do you actually combine the business needs of the printers and people putting together content with the content itself? Okay, and we'll talk a bit more about that this afternoon. Okay, was it really? Um, it represents fully composited content. There are no variables in PDF VT. That's one thing very important. People always ask, where do I specify the variables? It's fully compositive. It's a final form file format, four Fs. You know. um, it's optimized to take care of the complexity of, of graphical complexity, rendering performance, and production all combined. It's based upon PDFX4 and X5. Okay, for those of you who don't know what variable data printing is, they're pretty slides here. You'll look at them later. <laughs> There's something called transactional printing, which is going away really quickly. When we first started this thing, we thought that these large forms of Docutex and stuff would be a very good subject for PDFET. It isn't, because all you're getting are things from your utilities telling you to go to paperless. However, they're still going to be sending you all sorts of junk. Um, <laughs> actually very well graphically formed junk with your name in the sand and things of this in particular nature. That's what we call trans promo. That's the growth area. The phone company and the utilities are still going to send you stuff, but it's going to be graphically rich and not your bill. You're going to pay the bill and see the bill online. What are this type of workflow is? Is typically you have uh, data rules, you have templates, you have databases, all come together in some sort of compositing software, sometimes plugins. They produce some sort of means of printing or just simply publishing for electronic purpose, variable publishing content, and output. Okay, and the trouble though has been that doing this has been a problem. Uh, Chief curmudgeon of the industry, Frank Romano, basically looked at this as a, a very, an area ripe for some sort of solution. That's what PDFVT is. Okay, well, the types of problems we had with the other solutions for, be, uh, for variable data publishing, uh, typically solutions that didn't support the entire imaging model, you couldn't pre-flight the stuff, didn't have touch-up facilities, no archiving capabilities, vendor dependencies, you'd go to a particular vendor and they'd lock you into their solution so you couldn't go someplace else. Uh, lack of unified workflow, you had to do something different for variable data publishing than you did for traditional printing, and that cost you money. Okay, um, there were some other standards such as PPML and then something called PPML VDX. Um, they had these whole list of problems, okay? And basically many of them had to do with the fact that many of these other standards and propriety things were based upon PostScript, okay? And PostScript was very nice for 1983 uh, standard, okay? Um, however, PDF, just plain as out of the box, had problems for this as well. Performance issues, how long it took to create it, bloated PDF sizes, 
poor, uh, poor print performance, which is a problem when you're dealing with multiple hundred page per minute devices, okay? But the problem isn't the format, it's sort of what we do with the format. And that is what we tried to do with uh, PDF VT. Three conformance levels, PDF VT1 and VT2, uh, and PTF VT2S, okay? Um, differentiating <laughs> that. <laughs> I had to do it in some minutes. The, uh, the identification is uh, indicated in the front of it. PDF VT2, VT2S is a stream. It isn't a, a, a PDF file itself. It's a, a mine collection of files. Conformance levels, they are based upon PDF X4 and X5. Uh, they also were characterized by having something called document part hierarchy, which you'll learn about this afternoon if you're lucky. Okay. One thing that's interesting is, is that even though a PDF, X, a PDF VT file is based upon PDF X4 and X5, there's no requirement that you actually take advantage of that. Also a thing we'll discuss this afternoon. And you don't have to take advantage of something called X objects, although it's something that we're really based upon. And there you don't have to really provide any meaningful data, but the standard provides a mechanism for that. Okay, um, based upon these standards, X objects are, in terms of the DNA, what is it we're really trying to do? You're based upon PDF X4 and X5 and the advantages of that. Take advantage of it. X objects are used to represent repeating data. There are these three conformance levels. Each has advantages you'll learn about this afternoon. This metadata is really important. Mike Scrutton will give a very good detail of that this afternoon and why that's, how that is actually accomplished. Okay, job tickets interface with that. Likewise, part of this whole metadata thing. It's really a business type of thing as well as an optimization. Okay, a quick comparison of the solutions that are available for variable data printing. Start all the way at the left, you know, stick an old postscript and what you can do and not do with it. We go all the way to PDF VT. There's not much difference between PDF VT and PDF X4 and X5. This is PDF X4 and X5 with an attitude and a lot of metadata. You want to really take a look at it plain and simply. Okay, uh, word is getting out. We're actually getting some attention. A lot of the problem has been chicken and egg. When do you have a RIP? When do you have the PDF ET generators and things like that? Uh, the PDF Association actually has a booklet on this. Thank you. Um, and uh, we actually run a, a, won an award this past year for this. I'm co-chair of this. Tim Donahue is the, uh, un the other unindicted co-conspirator. Uh, our future activities depend upon changes in PDF X4 and X5, upon which we're based, and of course, upon PD ISO PDF 32000-2, which you've heard a bit about already. And of course, this organization is having a major portion of the responsibility of helping uh, get this thing out. Seven minutes is up. I beat the clock. Thank you. <laughs> Jonathan Riesche is from 4Ps. He's done a few things uh, before that. He's yeah. um, been PDF most of the time, I think. Yes. Not all of the time, somehow. Well, postscript. In okay, postscript before that. Yeah, okay. And so he knows this stuff as well. And he'll explain briefly what PDFX is and why it's important. Good. Well, if you're going to take the clock with you, I'm going to start mine because I want to know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. I'll try not to speak quite as fast as Leonard uh, or uh, Dove, the, uh, <laughs> some of the others. Um, I'd, I'd like to take you back to a time where we were still all afraid of the millennium bug, which is the late 1990s, uh, because that's when actually the standard I'm talking about was conceived and we started work on it. And um, there were a few problems in that time, and you'll recognize all of these problems because they're still around. We haven't solved that much yet. Uh, the first problem is that there is a whole bunch of software out there that you can use to create documents, and not all of them are created equally, so to speak. So you have some good ones that give you good output, or reasonable output at least, and then you have a whole bunch of other stuff that you can create PDF files with, or output with. Um, if you send it to your printer, that's when they grow gray hair, and, or lose hair and stuff. <laughs> the second problem, and this is... This is not a picture of one of my daughters, but it could be, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> you have a whole bunch of people that aren't really skilled graphic designers that are intent on designing stuff. And sometimes it even looks good, but if, again, if you give it to your printer, they start swearing and, and doing all other kinds of things. So uh, 
not really well-designed pieces. And then the third problem, and it's still, again, very accurate today, is that you have all of these files that are designed in one place and then printed or output somewhere else. Like I have a newspaper designed in, in Belgium somewhere and then the, it's sent digitally to Spain because a lot of Belgians happen to go there during summer and it's printed there and you want that process to go over well. So that's the problem, how do you solve that? And the first solution was kind of PDF. I mean, PDF is a very nice file format, there was good software around it, we had good support for PDF in graphic arts industry. Unfortunately for those people that thought that PDF was gonna be the ultimate solution to everything, um, although that's 42, um, there's a whole bunch of problems with PDF, potential problems, I have to say. And potentially, a PDF file could be made without fonts in it. That's not a very smart thing to do, but again, think of these non production-minded designers, it's exactly what they will do. They will create files that don't have the fonts, that use RGB, that are not, uh, are not created with the, the, the correct trim box or don't have bleed and all of these problems in there. PDF by itself doesn't stop you from doing any of that. So what does? Well, this nice gentleman will. Uh, this is the uh, Secretary General, if I remember the title correctly, of the ISO. And what the ISO did was uh, take some of the standardization work that was done around PDF and they built a PDFX standard out of that. And the official name is uh, ISO 15930. And it's known as PDFX and the X stands for blind exchange. You have to explain that to anyone because there is no way you can figure that out by yourself. It actually makes a lot of sense. What does blind exchange mean? It means that I can make something, I can design something I can save that as a PDFX file and I can send that to anyone else in the world. And they will be able to produce that in the same way that I have designed it. That's the goal. Now, what you have to do to get to that goal, you have to restrict a whole bunch of stuff out of PDF. You have to make sure that everything is embedded in the file. You have to restrict the number of color spaces that are used so that everybody understands what is in there. And basically, and that, that is something that was talked about for PDF A, uh, before as well, you have to take away any possible ambiguity that is in that PDF file. So that if, if I create something and I send it to you, you don't have to ask me questions about what my intent was with that particular document. It can just be produced as is. Okay, there is not one PDFX flavor because that would be way too, too easy. Uh, for, a, for a standards organization anyway. There's a whole bunch of them. And if you remember two, I'll be very happy. And I know I colored three, but again, that's just to create complexity. Uh, the, one, the first one is PDFX 1A. That is what every graphic art standard out there today is based on, more or less. Uh, all of this, the, the standardization work that is done by the Ghent Work Group, for example, is based on PDFX, A, PDFX 1A um, standard, uh, standard profiles. And that standard goes back to 2001, so it's been around for a while. It also means it works pretty well. The second one to remember is PDFX4, and I won't tell you much about that apart from the fact that it's kind of a difficult standard. There is a whole session tomorrow about what the, uh, some of the difficulties are and what some of the, the possibilities are. Why would you want to use PDFX? Why introduce that complexity? Well, this is kind of the technical reason. And what you're looking at on the left-hand side is what you have to do to do quality control on the file if you use the PDFX 1A standard. You check the check mark there. In this particular case, it's, it's called a PDF toolbox, but just about any tool out there supports PDFX 1A. So you check that and then you're done. If you don't do that, then you have to come up with all of the requirements by yourself. And what you see on the right-hand side is a very long list of all of the different checks that are actually part of that PDFX 1A standard. So by checking that, that one thing, compliancy with PDFX 1A, you're actually saying, I want to do all of this checking on the right-hand side. It's much easier to do that thing than to do this thing, trust me. The second reason is much more a business reason than a technical reason. Imagine as a consultant or even as a national standards organization, you go up to people and you tell them that you would like them to standardize on this 
pre-flight profile that you've created, this long list of rules that you've created, and you want them to standardize on that. Why? Because, well, you should be trusted, and this is a good idea, and it will save them money, and so on. It's much easier to go to those people and say, listen, this is a standard that was developed by the ISO that has gone through all of this rigid procedure, and there is a whole bunch of experts that spent a lot of time on making this. This is a good thing. People understand what ISO standards are about. And it's much easier to standardize on that, not by my clock, to standardize <laughs> on that <laughs> than to do it all yourself. Thank you. <laughs> So actually, this one I know I can do in less than seven minutes. Um, and part of it, as Olaf said, is that this is not one of those areas that traditional PDF developers have a lot of experience with. Uh, and so since most people didn't, I sort of got stuck with doing the uh, seven minutes on this one. So you'll bear with me as well. So PRC is Product Representation Compact. Actually, that was a name we made up. It was been called PRC for a long time, and I'll, I'll go over the history shortly. We made up the name to actually match the three letters. So it's kind of like PFD for Olaf. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we really made it up. What it is, in short, is it is a standard for storing 3D data in a very compact fashion. And what we're talking about, when you talk about 3D data, those of you who, most of you I suspect have very little experience with 3D, there's two general concepts that you can look at. Either you're talking about 3D visualization data, you're talking about tessel things like tessellations and NURBS, these are fancy 3D terms. Don't ask me to explain them, but those are the terms that are used in the industry. Um, but you're talking about how do you represent it visually? How do you render this thing? Uh, how do you put it all together into 3D space? The alternative is you could be talking about the information about that 3D data. Um, sort of things, what's called uh, PMI, uh, product manufacturing. If I were actually have a 3D printer or I was actually to build one of these things, how would I go about doing it? And believe it or not, those are actually two very separate things, and there are different standards for both of those. There's a, another standard called STEP, for example, which is more about the latter. So PRC is about visualization, and this is why it's relevant to us, because it's about, if we want to visualize data in PDF, PRC is going to help us do that. And, of course, we're concerned about size, and so that compact binary nature of the format is very significant. Um, what you see on the screen, if you were bothering to read it, that actually comes out of the standard, and I just highlighted um, some bits you can look at. But let, I want to really talk about the history, and, and as Olaf said, why do we care? So 3D was originally introduced in PDF in PDF 1.6 in 2004. It used another standard, uh, U3D, which is an ECMA standard. ECMA is another um, accredited standards body. Um, it's good. It's actually a very nice standard. Unfortunately, it's very verbose. So what you ended up with is if you made one of these things, you had a very large PDF file. Um, you know, in 2000, today, size, while important, not as important as it was back in 2006, 2004. So it was, it was problematic. Uh, we didn't get the level of adoption, and we, in this case being Adobe, the level of adoption that we had wanted. So we went out looking for better 3D technology, and we found it in a company in Lyon, France, called TTF, not to be confused with true type fonts. They actually didn't do fonts at all, they did 3D. Um, so we bought them, and with them we got this technology called PRC. So it came along as part of the acquisition, and we said, this is great, we're going to put it into PDF, and we're going to do it in the same way we did PDF itself, we're going to publicly document it. So we took the information that the company had put together and we published a public document that described the format. So from the moment we acquired it, this has been a publicly documented format, again, just like PDF itself was. Um, we rolled it into PDF itself with uh, Acrobat 8.1. So it did not make PDF 1.7, unfortunately. The timeframes just didn't match. So it is not part of 32,000-1. 
It is in PDF 1.7 with Adobe's Extensions Level 3. Um, and you're familiar, of course, with the extension level mechanism at 32,000. We did immediately afterwards start turning it over to the ISO for standardization. So once we realized it wasn't going to make 32,000 part one, we decided to pursue it on its own separate path. And that's actually what's been happening since 2009, is it's been on its own path towards standardization. Um, and it's unfortunately taking a very long time because it is a very complex standard. And unlike, as Matthew said earlier, where PDF itself was on the fast track, we decided to take this on a slower track and actually get it in and get it done correctly. Um, so there's been a lot of changes made to the standard to make it more reasonable, more ISO friendly. So in short, as I mentioned, what is it? It's a sequential binary file. So it's a big blob of data. Um, it is a very, very optimized reading and writing procedure. Um, in fact, the uh, file format is very tied to the algorithm that's used to read and write the data. So you can't just necessarily develop your own algorithm. You actually have to match the implementation algorithm that's used, and that's gone into very detailed in the spec. And as I said, it's all about visualization for very different things. And, and Olaf talked about some of the things that the engineering folks need, and this is, of course, about engineering. So why should you care? Um, obviously, if you don't do 3D at all, you don't care and you can ignore me, um, and that's perfectly fine. Um, if, however, you build a 3D, or excuse me, if you build a PDF consumption tool of some fashion, you're going to see these out there. There are a lot of 3D PDFs out there. In fact, and I should have put a slide up about this, there's a group called the 3D PDF Consortium. So there is a group who has founded themselves entirely on the development of 3D PDF. Um, it's a fairly sizable group. There's about a dozen members, including major groups, major companies like Airbus, Boeing, as well as software developers. So this is big, and they are continuing to develop and build around this technology, and they've been part of the PRC standardization process. Um, also, while PRC itself is continuing, we're going to be including that into 32,000 Part 2. So it will be a normative part of 32,000 Part 2. And so as PDF evolves, PRC will be a big part of that. And as I said, I can do it in under seven minutes. <laughs> Okay, so let me quickly introduce myself. I'm not from here, I'm from Germany. I work in the Hamburg office uh, um, with Adobe. I actually lead the XMP tech, uh, technology at Adobe, metadata in general, and I'm also engaged with um, standards, uh, bodies, and organizations because XMP in itself is, has so many flavors. It's available in so many domains. It goes way beyond PDF, and I will focus a little bit on that, but also focus on the related pieces uh, for you in uh, the session. Uh, there, will, there is no way basically to explain Adobe XMP in its whole in uh, seven minutes, but what I would like to do is just recommend the following book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the problem with this book, it's not available yet. Uh, it's, not even, <laughs> <laughs> it's not even written yet, that's the problem. <laughs> but if you come talk to me, I'll take pre-orders. <laughs> So the one thing I want to highlight is one of the models, I think you kind of read this in the back, so there is more than one way to screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me give you a little bit of background around XMP. So uh, most of you are familiar with this technology. XMP gives you a, a complete platform to manage your metadata for digital media. Uh, again, for a variety of domains and, and uh, media types. Uh, back in uh, the beginning of 2000, basically, XMP started around imaging and, uh, and document. So in the Adobe terms, this means uh, Photoshop and Acrobat. So since then, uh, Adobe has been adopted by uh, many more projects, uh, products within Adobe, but also externally. So the whole video suite is built on top of XMP since uh, Creative Suite uh, CS4, actually over to, uh, to Flash, but also to service side um, products within Adobe. Interestingly, this site here in Basel is offering a, a asset management system, a web experience management, and is a strong proponent of XMP in its system as it is built uh, on top of it and, and leveraging that. Also in the industry, there has been a lot of progress over the last couple of years. So one, of, uh, one example is 
is let's take Google for example. Google Picasa uh, has adopted it, Microsoft, um, and uh, a lot of others in, in that regards. So um, just, I think, to some degree, well-known parts of, of XMP, there have been some rearrangements inside of the XMP specification you want to watch out for. So there are still three parts of the XMP specification. The first part is the, the whole data modeling serialization piece, plus some core properties, the, the whole media <coughs> neutral portion of XMP. Uh, the second part, additional schema that has been defined by, uh, by Adobe, and also the part three, the storage, how to get things into files in and out. Uh, if you are dealing with XMP, you have to basically implement a technology stack that uh, consists of um, those pieces, like the data management, file management, user experience, and even more beyond that. And last but not least, uh, just as a reminder, XMP itself is fully extensible. As you all know, you can add your own metadata, you can use existing SDKs, and lots of implementations also in this room, lots of tools that uh, have been made available. This was a different slide. Okay. So let's go on. Uh, from the standards adoption side, so existing standards at the top, let me focus on uh, the bottom ones here, which are more recent. IPC, IPTC has uh, released a new version of its IPTC core and extensions um, standard that is based on top of XMP. Uh, PDFA, uh, you're in, in here that um, basically W3C Media Annotation Working Group has, um, we have worked with them on, on XMP adoption in the context of um, the internet and um, um, web published uh, file formats. SIPA, SIPA is a Japan organ, uh, organization of camera manufacturers defining standards uh, such as EXIF, which is used in all hardware devices. They have um, published a specification on how to uh, store XMP, uh, sort of store EXIF metadata inside of XMP, which we have done for years, but now SIPA has taken over that part to basically give all the hardware manufacturers a way to leverage XMP uh, from, that, from that angle. And I think with the last item, I'm happy to declare success in this year, actually. So as of beginning of February, uh, XMP has become an ISO standard, in particular part one. So remember the three parts. The first part has been turned over to ISO and the TC130 um, working group two in task force four. Um, <coughs> it's now available and can be uh, obtained on the ISO side. So that's a great success and uh, all of the others have been participating in there, so thanks for that. And uh, beyond that, we are engaging with other uh, ISO groups, for example, TC42 working group 18 is imaging photography. We're also working with them to turn other parts over into the domain specific ISO groups um, beyond what TC130 did from a more generic point of view. Okay. So last but not least, I wanted to just highlight five, um, there are many more, but the, for me, the most, uh, the most important misperceptions I've heard about XMP. So the first one, uh, it is yet another proprietary metadata implementation. Uh, it, is, it has been introduced by Adobe, but built on existing standards like uh, Dublin Core. It's being used as part of XMP, as most of you know. It's not reinventing the wheel, and it's playing well with existing standards, reconciling existing information, and not uh, doubling it. The second item is an important uh, aspect from my point. So yes, the design goal is to embed metadata into, into digital media, media, but you can use the three parts separately. You can model your information and use it for communication between systems. And you can add own schemas, um, but you can also put this into the file, but not necessarily all the case, uh, always the case. XMP metadata is secure because it's embedded in the file. Um, Two things can happen, one of which uh, the metadata can be lost throughout the workflow um, because of file format transformations. And the second is that if you, for example, take a file that's like a JPEG with XMP in it, you drop it on a text editor, you can read this information. So it's um, not a surprise for people who work with it. It's just text information, but it's not encrypted, <coughs> nothing else. If you wanted to get security, encryption, privacy, you usually encrypt the whole con container, such as PDF, for example. XMP cannot be extended with my own custom metadata. I'm still hearing that, and um, XMP has been designed as an extensible platform. So yes, you can do that for sure in the data model, but also from an SDK perspective. And the last item here, XMP replaces existing metadata standards, and still IPTC is often mentioned. So when will XMP take over? That's not the point. It's an underlying platform, and other standards build on top of that. So if you have own schematas, you basically are um, 
are basically leveraging the underlying platform for that. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs>